epistle reading today comes from Galatians 1, verses 1 through 12. Paul, an apostle, sent neither by human commission nor from human authorities, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the members of God's family who are with me. To the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to set us free from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who are confusing you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should proclaim to you a gospel contrary to what we proclaim to you, let that one be accursed. As we have said before, so now I repeat, if anyone proclaims to you a gospel contrary to what you received, let that one be accursed. Am I now seeking human approval or God's approval? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still pleasing people, I would not be a servant of Christ. For I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel that was proclaimed by me is not of human origin. But I did not receive it from a human source, nor was I taught it. But I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Our second reading today is from the Gospel according to St. Luke. It's from the seventh chapter of that Gospel. And here we read, beginning in verse 1, When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. There a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him. This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I didn't even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one go, and he goes, and that one come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let's pause for a moment of prayer. O oh God, we give you thanks for this blessed day. We thank you for faithful Christians who have lived throughout time, for their love for you and all of the sacrifices that they've made because of it. God, we know that so much of our lives, so much of the good that we're able to share with others is built upon our willingness to sacrifice for others. So we pray that you'd bless us, reflecting upon your grace and fill us with your spirit anew so that we can share your grace and your love, indeed the gospel, in our day and age. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, one day, an eight-year-old girl, she asked her dad if uh, she could go to work with him. When they arrived at dad's office, the little girl looked around, and she began to cry. Well, everyone in the office was concerned, and they gathered around her and her father. Dad asked, what's the matter, sweetheart? His daughter replied, 
Dad, where are all the clowns you said you work with? <laughs> yes, everything we say around young children is significant uh, to them. And the same is true about every body. Everyone is significant. And everyone has something significant to offer. And what that means is that therefore all of us should live every moment of our lives prepared to witness and to celebrate God's transforming love. His love that transforms the world through everyone who has opened their heart to his grace. And that includes us as well. God can do great things through each and every one of us. The dysfunctional ways that this world determines the significance of a person and what that person has to offer, they sadly hold sway in this life. But make no mistake, worldly criteria are worth as much as an ashtray on a motorbike to God. <laughs> they have no eternal significance. They shouldn't even have significance in this world, God's world, because to God, everyone matters. This is a major theme of All Saints Sunday every year, that everyone is a saint and has something to offer. That in Christ, God considers each of us and everything we have to offer of profound importance and deeply values what we do in good faith for his kingdom. And that's regardless of what any person thinks about that. In Christ, we've got the king of everything in our corner. In both of our scripture readings today, loudly and proudly proclaim this basic yet powerful Christian truth. In our passage from St. Luke's Gospel, we read about an encounter that Jesus had with someone called a centurion. We're not told this centurion's personal name, only his title as a centurion. Now, this event took place in the city of Capernaum on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, which, as we've discussed many times before, was the geographical center of Jesus' earthly ministry. And uh, earlier in his gospel, St. Luke tells us that Jesus had just finished delivering an important collection of teachings that uh, scholars today call his Sermon on the Plain. Uh, Jesus gave his Sermon on the Mount on a mountain, and he gave his Sermon on the Plain, guess where? On a plain. That's right. Not the flies, but a plain uh, on the ground. When he began teaching after this, those with certain illnesses uh, in the crowd, he began healing them. Uh, this was his custom to teach and then to heal the people that he taught. And uh, this is when Jesus had this encounter with this centurion, who apparently heard about the miracles that Jesus was performing, and he sent some local Jewish leaders to ask for Jesus' help on his behalf. In verse 2 of our passage, these local leaders tell Jesus that one of the centurion's servants is ill. And they ask Jesus to heal this servant. Now, first of all, what's a centurion, right? Uh, who was this guy making this request of Jesus? Well, centurions in Jesus' day were Roman military officers. See, the army of Rome, it consisted of three types of soldiers. First was the Praetorian Guard. They were Caesar's bodyguard, kind of like our Secret Service today, only the Secret Service doesn't go around indiscriminately beating up people in society uh, like the Praetorian Guard did, but uh, they protected Caesar. Then you had the auxiliaries, troops who were not Roman citizens and who were usually the first people that Roman commanders sent into battle. But lastly, 
in the Roman army. You had the legionaries consisting of both infantry soldiers and officers. And they were all Roman citizens. And the backbone of this whole sophisticated apparatus, the ones who held the whole thing together and focused its energy, they were mid-level officers, legionaries, called centurions. Most of these guys had served at least 15 to 20 years as infantry soldiers before being promoted to this position. So they were dedicated. They were seasoned veterans of a conquering army that enemies messed with at their own peril. These were the type of guys who would go to town on somebody if they looked at them the wrong way. Uh, Joseph, the animal Barboza, the brutal 1960s mafia hitman, he was a limp noodle compared to these guys. And uh, they were called centurions, from the Latin word centuria, meaning 100, because each of them commanded anywhere from 80 to 100 troops, within a larger legion of around 6,000 troops. But the centurions, they were very easy to spot among all the other soldiers because they wore a special helmet and a more ornate harness than everybody else. And they carried a vine wood staff as a symbol of rank. And I placed in your bulletins today an artist's depiction of what uh, a centurion probably looked like in Jesus' day. So centurions, they stood out. And because of that, in Jesus' society, they had become highly visible symbols of Roman tyranny. When first century Jews thought about the people who took away their freedom, who invaded their homeland, terrorized those they loved, stripped their land of vital resources, and forced thousands into chronic poverty, they thought of Roman centurions with their fancy, flashy uniforms, barking out orders to the soldiers under their command. Which is what would have made the actions of the centurion that we read about in our story today seem so remarkable to so many in Jesus' day. It would have been a real mind bender to folks. For we read in verse 4 through 6 that the local Jewish leaders speaking on the centurion's behalf, they say to Jesus, this man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. And Jesus went with them. So at some point in his life, this centurion, this centurion had a change of heart about the people that he had been raised to hate and paid to humiliate. So much of a change of heart, in fact, that he was at that moment asking Jesus, a Jewish rabbi, to help him. Which is a beautiful gesture on his part. But it's one that would have also been very dangerous for that centurion. Other Roman officers, his superiors, and troops under his command, and other officials wouldn't have liked this at all. The status quo was that Romans kept conquered peoples, including the Jews, under their heel. Roman leaders determined that most Jews were simply not significant as people. Otherwise, they would have treated them differently. The historical record would have attested to that. They would have treated them like they treated Roman citizens. Their own citizens who were protected by laws, not unlike what we call the rights that all Americans enjoy today. Conquered people throughout the empire didn't enjoy these basic protections. Yet here is this guy, this centurion, treating Jews as significant. Building a place of worship for and asking help from the people he's supposed 
to be terrorized. That would have been risky for him among his peers. But it's important to keep in mind that Jesus would have also been putting himself at risk by agreeing to help this guy. The crowds following Jesus were excited about the idea of Jesus healing Jews, their fellow countrymen. But healing a Roman officer? Those people who burnt down my house, killed my dog, and forced me off my land? Let them rot, many people in Jesus' society would have thought. Most people, therefore, in Jesus' position, would have concluded that neither this Roman centurion nor his servant were significant enough for them to stick their neck out for. But Jesus, of course, he wasn't most people. We all know how Jesus felt about the way worldly opinions and standards separated people, ultimately hurting everybody in the process. Jesus wanted to break down barriers so that everyone treating each other as significant could live together in peace. Romans and Jews alike living together in peace. So Jesus went to heal this centurion's servant. But both Jesus and the centurion weren't done trying to piece together their fractured culture just yet. For in verse 6 we read that as Jesus approaches the centurion's home, the centurion, he, he sends somebody to say, and the person says this in front of everybody, for everyone to hear, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. Amazing. So Jesus responds in verse 9 and 10. He says, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. And then he heals the centurion's servant. So a seasoned Roman military officer, he tells Jesus here, a traveling Jewish rabbi, Jesus who didn't have an official title even among the Jews, he tells Jesus for every Roman to hear that he, the centurion, was not worthy to have Jesus, a conquered person, enter his home. Now other Roman officials must have loved that. Uh, and Jesus then tells the Israelites that this centurion's faith was greater than many of theirs, which uh, I'm sure many of them would have been thrilled about as well. But in so doing, Jesus and the centurion, they declared to the world that the power to determine someone's significance doesn't lie with this worldly standard here or this other dim-witted one over here. But rather, in God's eyes, everyone, everyone is significant. Regardless of what's happened in the past, everybody can turn their lives around at every new moment. And God will receive them because everyone is significant. In our epistle reading today, St. Paul drives home this same point. He's talking in the passage about a different gospel that some in the first century Galatian church were teaching. That uh, when we look at this gospel a little bit more closely, it was simply an elaborate way for some in that church to exclude certain others from full participation in the church. To tell them they had nothing to offer, in other words. The true gospel, the good news, Paul teaches us, is that in God's kingdom, everybody has something to offer. So our passages this morning, they challenge us in our day and age to ask ourselves, do I judge my own significance or anybody else's by 
worldly standards? And if so, do I have the courage to declare in my heart that everyone, including me, is significant in God's eyes? See, this is a truth that if everyone embraced, could heal the world. Amen.